Um, well, as I was uh, just saying, uh, I originally had submitted four papers to this uh, conference, and they accepted all of them, and then they grouped three of them into this one presentation. So uh, I still prepared them as three separate talks, so uh, we need to be careful with the pacing. <laughs> uh, thank you. And um, so maybe what I'll try and do is, you know, maybe 15 minutes a talk or a little more. And if you have questions at the end of each talk, probably ask them then so you don't have to remember them. Um, but anyways, um, I've never given the talks before, so I don't actually know how long it takes to go through all this material. Um, so we'll just have to start and see how it works out. Um, so first of all, facets is, you know, how many, how many people have heard of facets? Nobody, right? Um, it's something I've actually been working on for over 10 years. So. And I've given lots of talks at PyCons in the US and everywhere. Uh, it's only in the last three years I've moved to, to the Philippines. Um, anyhow, um, facets is all about reactive programming. And hopefully you'll see what that means. And I've got a slide in the second presentation that goes into that a little bit. But in this first talk, I'm going to be going over the facets tool framework. Um, and that's basically, it's a framework all about building custom visual tools. Um, and it's done by composing small tools to make bigger tools. And in some ways, it's kind of like using a, a Unix command shell type tool. You build up a lot of little tiny tools and you make a, you pipe them all into each other and you end up with something which has a much higher level of functionality than any of the individual pipes. Same, same basic idea. But in this case, instead of using little things that take standard in and produce standard out, we're using small, sharp visual tools. Okay, and hopefully you'll see that as I go through it. And I thought we'd start with a quick demo of what it is I'm talking about. And the demo we're going to do is to build the presentation tool I'm using now to give this talk. Um, I put little reminders into myself so I remember what I'm supposed to do. Okay, so right now, unfortunately, I was set this up on my laptop and we are getting truncated a bit, so I may have to adjust windows here and there. Um, so this is an, an instance of the Python, uh, the facets tool framework. And we're going to start, like I said, by trying to reconstruct this tool. So I'm going to pop up a list of tools. And right at the bottom, because I just wrote it last week, is presentation. And it comes up and it tells me, helpfully, that I need to connect a file name or some text to display a presentation. So I'm going to go in and add another tool, which is a text tool. And, you know, I'll just start typing some text. We'll see that, I guess. Well, nothing happens, not too surprisingly. I didn't actually tell it to, for the tools to talk to each other. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on an icon here and is, I'm going to tell it to connect the text to the presentation text in the presentation. And as soon as I do that, now the tools are connected and I can see that I've got my first slide up there. I go back into the text tool, modify that. Okay. So, you know, we've basically got a tool up and running. And now this isn't too useful because I'm not going to sit here for an hour typing in slides. So I'm going to uh, bring in another tool. So I'm going to bring a file tool this time. And I'm going to bring in a file stack. And this is a tool that is kind of like a directory or a file list. And so I'm going to put that one next to it. In fact, I think I'm going to move them all over to the left side to try and reconstruct the same layout I've got in the uh, tool I'm using. And we go through the same process where we connect um, to the text file containing a presentation. And so now um, we start that up and you can see that in fact it's running the same exact presentation we're running here just because a lot of these tools are smart. So this one happens to remember the last file I'd selected. So uh, it's pretty much the same tool that I'm running now if we uh, we're done with this. I just wanted to show you the basic idea of what the tool framework is about. If we go back here, uh, you can see it, it's actually the same exact tool. Okay. So creating, uh, you can create new tools that plug into this framework, and that is usually fairly easy. Most of the heavy lifting is done using 
uh, facets editors and change notifications. Change notifications are sort of the, the heart of the reactive programming model. It's when something happens in one object, modifies its state, anybody that's interested in that will be notified of that. Uh, and that's part of what makes things reactive. Editors are a, sort of a visual component that are reactive themselves and they're the ones that display changes that occur in object state. So since we have lots of those that are pre-built ready to use, as I was saying, most of the heavy work is done by the underlying facets framework. So making new tools easy, all we have to do is define the necessary inputs and outputs that we want to use. Inputs and outputs are normal facets. Uh, facets you can think of as being normal object attributes, but they're a little smarter. They have metadata and they have type. And of course, uh, since it's Python, one of the types that we have is one that says work just like a normal Python type. Uh, but you can also be more stringy. You can say this one's an int, this is a string, this is a file, and so on. Um, the metadata that you attach to these facets, so the, the feature metadata, is what ties this into the tool framework. And we'll see a slide later that shows how that is set up. In fact, here it is. Um, so we have tools at the top, and these are the things we're running now, like the presentation tool. And these are just examples of that. Below that, we have the, the facets framework itself, uh, which has a complete UI architecture and lots of different kinds of editors. Like I said, editors are the things that uh, visualize uh, pieces of an object state. OK, so we have things like grids. Grids are useful for displaying ta tabular data, text is strings. Um, scrubber editors are for ranges of things, so you want to change the values of things. Set editors, you might have a, a Python set. You can actually just bring it up in an editor and visually uh, edit the contents of the set, so on and so forth. And all of that sits on top of the, uh, the UI abstraction layer. So this, in, in theory, works with any of the standard Python toolkits, like uh, Qt4, PySide, which is a variation on Qt, WXPython, so on and so forth. Uh, if you write a new abstraction layer, then all of this stuff just works on top of it. Uh, in practice, as we'll see later, uh, I spend most of the time, because I actually do this stuff, uh, this work for a company that builds a large scientific application. Uh, and they're mostly interested in QT, so that's where most of the effort's gone, but uh, the abstraction layer does uh, isolate that from the, the details of most of the UI toolkits out there. Um, I thought now we could maybe just take a quick shot of writing a, a visual tool. This one has been highly compressed to, to fit on a slide. I've taken all the comments and white space out. Uh, but basically, we're going to do the standard Linux or Unix word count um, tool, but a visual version. So at the top, we have the five facets. One is the name. That's just the name of the tool. One is its input, the text. And we just define that to be a stir or a string. And this is some of the metadata I was talking about. By providing connect metadata, we tell the tool framework that the other tools will be able to connect to this one. And then the other three facets are just properties. Those are things, uh, notice the capital P, not the lowercase Python. These are smart properties, so they can have a type. And uh, the reason they're smart is you can, if you look at the bottom here, we actually have the definitions for the properties. And we're saying that each of the properties' values depend upon the input value, the text. So this is important for the reactive nature of the system because we need to know when it's time to, to try to get the new value of the property. Uh, and then the middle section here is the view. The view is the actual user interface that is going to appear for the, uh, the tool. And we'll see that on the next slide. So this is the complete body or the complete text of, the, of this word count tool. Again, it's a little compressed. Um, here's an example where I had added it to the tool framework just by, uh, we'll see how to do that in a little while. And now I've taken the text tool, the same one we used to build this presentation tool, and I've connected that up to the text input of the word count. And then I just started, uh, or I copy and pasted uh, one of my presentation slides into the text tool. And you can see that uh, you know, the word count tool at the bottom is showing the, the results of that. Um, as I mentioned before, this. Uh, the tools are sitting on top of uh, several different layers. One is the UI layer, which you know, we just saw an example of. The other is sort of the backplane layer, which is how the tools communicate. And that's all done via the uh, doc window. A doc window is a special uh, type of window that manages uh, all of the tools within the framework. Its main 
um, function from a user point of view is managing all the splitter bars and the little tabs at the top that we used to drag windows around and so on. Uh, but under the covers, it also generates key lifecycle events so that when tools get added or taken out of the framework, it generates uh, open and close events um, to anyone that's registered. In this case, the things that are registered are called features. A feature is a plug-in for a dock window that uh, allows new capabilities or features to be added to the dock window environment. And this can be done on a per window basis. So you might have one dock window with one list of features and another dock window in the same application with a different list of features. Um, and it receives and processes the, the tool open and close events that dock window generates. And that's what allows it to sort of hook these tools together. Um, and the way it does that is it uses uh, facets metadata introspection tools uh, to go in and as a tool gets loaded, it finds the object, uses the introspection to find out where the connections to and from can be made. And you use that information to figure out if, if you want to activate or use this tool here, what kinds of other inputs or outputs is, or, or is it going to be compatible with and other tools currently plugged into the same framework. Uh, and then users can enable and disable which features they want to use. Even though uh, the framework itself may have a whole bunch of features uh, installed or applied, the user can also turn some on or turn some off as they uh, see fit. And all you have to do is to, um, well, I'm reminding myself here again. So here we can see that I have a bunch of features uh, that are installed here and in, in use. And most of everything except the debug feature is enabled. Uh, and debug is something you use just for that, for debugging. So we don't need that in the, in the middle of doing a presentation. Um, now, the framework itself comes with another standard features. And there's quite a, how are we doing on time, by the way? It's, uh, when did we start? So you are 11 minutes in. 11 minutes in, OK. Um, so there's a lot of. Um, features that come with the system, and I'm not going to go through all of them one by one, but uh, I'll mention a couple. So for the one that we're mostly using in this demo and that I've been talking about is the connect feature. That's the one that finds the, uh, the metadata attached to each tool and figures out which inputs and are compatible with which, out, with out, which outputs. Um, another useful one is the options feature. So if you have a tool that's going to have some options that the user might want to change around, you don't have to write your own uh, you know, mechanism for doing that. You just create an options view, which is similar to the view we had in the other tool, uh, the code that we looked at. And the, uh, the options feature will go in and manage that for you. So it'll add a little tool, an icon to the toolbar. And if the user wants to do it, he just hovers over there and selects the, uh, the options dialog, and it'll pop up and be presented. Um, another useful one is the save state feature. So the user might be changing all the options in your tool, and maybe it'd be nice to remember those from session to session, so it doesn't have to keep reconfiguring the tool each time. So all you have to do is attach save state metadata to whatever facets in your object uh, re or need to have their say, uh, state saved from one session to the next. And then the save state feature will manage that. It'll use introspection to discover all those facets. And whenever they change values, again, using the reactive nature of the framework, it'll automatically per, uh, uh, persist those into a database of all the, uh, the stuff it's keeping track of. So then you, know, you, don't, you don't have to write any of that code when you write a tool. And so there are a whole bunch of these features. And uh, for the most part, uh, they're transparent to uh, users uh, that when you write a tool, you don't have to do it. All you have to do is attach appropriate metadata, like we did in the example when we had the connect uh, metadata. And of course, uh, developers using the framework can define new features, in which case they can just be plugged into a dock window, and uh, they'll be available to any of the tools uh, running under that. And um, so what we have here is an example of the toolbar feature, which is the, uh, the thing that manages all of the, the different uh, debug or uh, all the different uh, dock window features that are enabled for this particular tool. So this will vary from tool to tool based upon which features introspected and found metadata that they understood about your tool. This toolbar gets dynamically created. And um, so it's a custom toolbar. It's available for each tool. You don't write any explicit code to create the toolbar. Uh, it's created and managed by the tool framework. Um, the each feature which is compatible with that tool will automatically 
enable and create whatever icons or other um, you know, UI elements it needs to uh, appear. And from the user's point of view, it's accessed simply by hovering the pointer over the Windows tab feature icon. So you can see up here on the main presentation tab, I have a little icon. It's normally grayed out, but as I move over the tab, it, it highlights. And then when I move the pointer over it, you can see all the various tools that are enabled, the connection tool and layout, some of the others that are available. Now, uh, any developer that's using the tool framework can customize uh, the framework for specific uses. So it's not just a, uh, a pre-configured framework. You can sort of create custom framework that you want to use within your tool environment. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I, uh, well, you can give each framework a, a custom application name. And for, for this talk, I gave this uh, particular framework the, uh, the name PyCon AV. You can see it shows up uh, Shows up somewhere else. <laughs> I'm actually running a different tool here. So um, you can also specify a custom tool walk. So you saw when I was building the tool, we had that long laundry list of available tools. Well, in your particular environment that you're working on, you may not need that entire list, or you may have some own your own custom tools that you've written. So you can create your own custom toolbox. Uh, so that allows you to create your own uh, custom environment. And you only make available whatever tools you want to whatever users you're going to have for this environment. And it's all controlled using a simple text file. Uh, so here's a little example of that. It's basically a one-line entry for each tool where you give the sort of the user name, what he's going to see in the menu, and then just the, uh, the path information, what package and class name available. And if you want to create levels of nesting, you can create, uh, just by having a line with only a, a label on it, you can create a, a menu level. So that's all you have to do to create a custom uh, toolbox. Now one of the nice things that's available is you can quickly slap together a tool using the uh, populating the, the framework or the, you know, the framework with a set of tools connecting them up. Once you get it to working the way you want, you have the option to create a standalone Python module from that if you want. So that gives you the ability to you know, copy to all your systems. You don't have to recreate the entire tool framework on exactly as you set it up. Uh, you can share it with your colleagues or publish it wherever you want. Um, and the way you do that is use the uh, perspective export uh, option. And we can try it out now. And so what I'm going to do is the same thing I did before. I'm going to launch the tool framework again. Um, so we've already built the tool in our last session. So when we reloaded it, um, it's exactly, it comes back the same way. You can have more than one tool to find. Uh, it uses, if you're familiar with Eclipse, it has a similar idea of perspectives. So a perspective is one collection of tools that you know, all been hooked together. But you can have any number of perspectives. So, uh, uh, well, this is a new one that I created just for this conference. So other than, I haven't actually created any yet. Uh, but what I wanted to show was that we can export a standalone tool. So when you do that, it pops up a dialog and uh, give it a better name than default, so I'm going to say presentation, and uh, that's probably good enough. You, know, you can actually see the code that's generated down this window here if you're the curious type. Um, it's, it's well structured, so you can go in if you wanted to and change it. Uh, but we're just going to save it for the time being, and we're done. And so we now have a, uh, a tool, that, this same tool has now been saved as a, the presentation.py file. In fact, I may have overlaid the one I'm actually running, <laughs> uh, which is fine. It should be the same tool. Uh, one of the other tools that comes with the, the framework is something called a workbench, and that's what we're actually running now. So the workbench program keeps track of all the standalone tools you've generated. One, this is a tool I wrote like two weeks ago, and it... Because I, uh, you know, over the last year, I'd been developing lots of different tools that I use, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis for different workflow type things, and you know, I probably had a dozen tools, and I was starting uh, to forget what their names were, you know. So I thought it'd be nice to have a workbench that sort of kept track of everything you've done. So that's what this tool does. It keeps track of every standalone tool you've generated. Uh, you can easily order, add, remove tools, so uh, you don't have to remember or put them in the order that you want. And you can run it in a single or multi-tool mode. So single tool mode is one where it's, uh, you can only run one tool at a time. Multi-tool allows you to do that. You can have multiple tabs and tear them off and do all kinds of stuff. 
Um, and again, we're going to try it out now. We're going to launch the uh, workbench, which is the exact same thing we're running now. And you can see here that I've actually created a bunch of tools. Well, first is the presentation tool, which is the one that we're running. Uh, but I can load another tool, such as uh, the definitions tool. Ah, very nice. Now, the, uh, you can bring up the list of tools and you can organize them differently. So, for example, right now we have the presentation tool first. If I wanted to bring the animation station, um, I, don't know, I just disabled it, but let's see. Bring that back to the top. Now, if we uh, go to the list here, we'll see that the animation station now the first tool. So, you can use it to organize. Again, you can go back and forth between the single and the multi-tool mode. So that's it for the, uh, pre uh, the workbench tool. How are we doing in time? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Um, okay. So it, this is very similar to if you've ever created Linux command line tools. It's the same kind of process. Creating tools is fairly easy. You know, we have an example in 20 lines where you can make a tool. Uh, creating an effective tool is a little bit harder. The, the trick is, again, not to do too much in one tool. You have to remember that the tool itself is not a complete application. It's going to be one part of it. Uh, and that it should only do one thing. You know, you're going to allow the... Uh, if you've done it right, you're going to be able to just sit back and let the users figure it out. So they're going to let their needs and their imagination and the tool framework kind of work together and uh, create a, a seamless whole. Uh, since we are running a little tight, I'm going to go through these last couple slides fairly quickly. It's, this is all, all the code and facets is BSD licensed. Uh, current status, it runs on uh, the 2x version of Python. And it does require uh, to do the UI stuff, PyQt4 and NumPy. NumPy is kind of a loose requirement. It's only used by a couple of things, but you know, it's better off if you've got it installed. Um, it's sort of the codes in always a per perennial version one alpha, <laughs> mostly because uh, other than the company I do it for, not a lot of people have really picked up and started using it. So uh, I've been keeping it in an alpha state. The code itself has been fairly stable. It's been in use in a lot of different places for 10 years. So I mean, it's fairly stable. Uh, it's in alpha because I want to, uh, uh, you know, as I work on this stuff, I find that the APIs always need a little tweaking. So I, I didn't want to lock them down. Uh, for the particular part of it, there's over 70 tools available now within the, uh, the framework. And, of course, you're free to add your own. This is various information about where the, uh, the stuff is. Now, all three presentations have the exact same slide at the end, so I'm not going to stop too long here. I'll do more on the last uh, page. So if anyone has any particular questions now that they don't want to wait on, go ahead and fire them off. If not, I'll just launch into the next one. Well, you know, it's mostly uh, the way I envisage people would use it. Be like developers, you know, they they need their own. Like they write a quick shell script to do something. So they probably aren't going to publish it and let other people use it. You know, it's just something they do use on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's sort of the the rationale for the framework. Now, what I do find is that you know, if some of these tools work well enough, you could give them to other people. So which is part of the reason it has the publish thing, where you can create a standalone module and and give that to other people. But again, it's mostly a framework I imagine that pe developers would use if they're doing visual type things. You know, if you're just doing uh, things that are non-visual, obviously you don't need a tool like this. But a lot of the stuff I do, and we'll see more of that in, in sort of the next presentation. Uh, but if you're doing visually oriented tools, this has a lot of tools that you can bolt together quickly. You know, things like grids and editors and all kinds of stuff. So uh, it's, it's mostly used for, for that kind of thing. Uh, it's not really for building applications. We, there's lots of things in facets for doing that, but they're not, you know, quick and dirty tools. I mean, you know, you've got to lay a groundwork and, and bolt things together. This is sort of just a visual way of doing tools fairly quickly. Um, okay. Anything else? Okay. Uh, all right. So now we're going to go on to the next presentation, which is on the animation system. Now again, all these talks deal with some aspect of the facet system, and um, so when are we supposed to be done exactly? We started, I guess, at 35 after. Yeah. Okay. And um, 
So in this particular one, we just covered the tool frame, but now we're going to be covering the animation system. And I'd start off here, since people aren't that familiar with what Facets is, is that there are main, six main features of what the whole Facets framework provides. And I'll, let me list them out first, and I'll talk about them briefly. Brief, briefly. So it provides uh, every class or anything you use that derives from the has facets framework gets these six capabilities automatically. So that's the ability to initialize any uh, object attribute. You know, in Python, you have to pretty much set them in your constructor. Well, if you're using facets, you don't have to. In fact, you can do it declaratively, or every uh, based on its type, it may just have a nice default value available for you. It also validates data. So if you've given a fairly strong type, you know, as like an int, then it'll make sure that you can't assign anything other than ints to it. In, in most cases, it'll coerce it if it can. If it's totally uncoercible, you know, it'll raise an exception. Uh, and there's lots of types available, and you can create your own types. Now, the types are, are fairly rich. I mean, they're not, uh, they're richer than most type languages. So you can create ranges, you know, I think the last language to add ranges was like Pascal. Um, but you can do that kind of stuff. And that's actually fairly useful, because when you come around to doing a UI, if it knows about the type, it knows what kind of UI you're probably going to want for that. And that's one of the big payoffs of using this, is that it helps in building a, you know, a user interface to be able to have this stuff. Uh, you can delegate, so you can say, well, I don't actually want to have this data. I'm going to delegate it to this object over here. That's not a feature you use a lot, but when uh, you do need it, it's fairly handy. The, uh, the next two are the most important ones. One is notify. So if any part of your object state changes, it generates notifications to any interested parties. And you can either explicitly register, you know, this is publish, subscribe kind of stuff. So you can either uh, subscribe to notifications, or you can just sort of declare it, say, and this is one of the nice features. You can just say, well, if any of these six facets change value, let me know. Okay? So you don't have to write the you know, six different uh, subscribe methods. So you can do it very uh, quickly and easily when you write your code. Visualize the ability to create user interfaces from any of these facets. And uh, that's actually where, if you look at the package, that's where the bulk of the code, probably 80% of the code is all the different, there's like you know, 60, 70 different editors you can use to, you know, graphics and tables and, you know, simple things, buttons and checkboxes, but uh, some fairly sophisticated stuff. We're going to see that a little more in, in this slide. And then finally, sort of the newest feature of the thing, which is that uh, this was sort of inherent, but I've only recently in the last couple of years added the ability to explicitly animate anything in the, in the system. Uh, and so this is what we're going to be talking about is this last feature during this particular talk. Um, so, you know, everyone knows what animation is. You know, we have Lucasfilm guys here. They can tell you a lot more than I can. But in the, in the specific case of facets, animation is defined as being program controlled change of an object's attributes over time. Okay. So, and what you really expect, though, is, you know, that sounds pretty dry and boring, but Typically, changing an att object attributes because of all the notifications that occur is going to have a lot of side, effect, side effects. And those are typically going to drive an animation visually. Okay, because most animations are, are done with some visual aspect, although it's not a requirement. All right, so this presentation tool is actually written in facets. Uh, I wrote it last week. And so we have examples of, of animation built into the, in this particular tool. So in this case, uh, we have an entry in the slide coming on, and in what's being animated is its origin facet. And bring on the next one, and uh, same thing. Okay, so the animation API in facet is actually very simple. Okay, it consists of basically one method. Is any object that derives from has facets has a method called animate facets, which takes a number of arguments, which we'll talk about a little more. And using it, any object in the, in the system can be animated. For example, um, here's an imaginary object that uh, we do an animate facet on. We're animating its opacity attribute. And we're, we're saying that we want to, over a one second interval, that's the 1.0, we want it to animate from uh, wherever it starts to zero, which is basically becoming fade. So if we backspace that, we can see that thing fading out, running that kind of animation. Um, so the animate facets method is, is actually fairly powerful because it'll help you can animate multiple concurrent animations on the same object at the same time. Um, 
if you have multiple animations running on the same facet, so like the opacity one, it'll manage that for you. It'll automatically queue them up sequentially, so that after the first animation is done, it'll, it'll run the next animation and so on and so forth. Or alternatively, if you want it to preempt and replace that currently running animation, it'll do that too. You can use one of the parameters that'll override that. There's also a couple of secondary uh, methods which come in handy every now and then. One is the uh, halt animated facets. It basically, typically is used like if you're shutting down an application that might be running, you know, 50 animations, you don't want to keep track of that. You can just say, you know, halt all the animated facets, shut them all down right now. And you can give it parameters and so on. And there's also its uh, sort of related animated facets which says, well, I don't remember all the facets I have animated. Tell me which ones are going. So I can use that and you can do some introspection and maybe write some kind of tools that use that. Um, there's also, if you're writing more complex animations, you can use a couple of helper classes. One is concurrent animation, the other is sequential animation. They do pretty much what they say. Manage uh, running a lot of different animations on different objects, different facts, fa uh, on different facets concurrently or sequentially. Um, now in terms of creating an animation, there are sort of five key parameters. One is the duration, you know, how long does the animation run. The other is what is the starting value for the animation. The other is the ending value, so it runs between those two values. The other is the path. The path are the, sort of the intermediate values that it takes in going from the beginning value to the ending value. Uh, the obvious one would be a linear path. but you know, since you can animate anything, you know, it may not be numbers, you know. It may be text, it may be, you know, some other kind of data that you have. So the path, you know, you might start with point A and end at point B, but you can provide a path that says, how do I go from point A to point B? Similarly, a tweener is something uh, similar in that, but it controls the flow of time through the animation. So you say the animation is going to run three seconds, but it doesn't have to run in a continuous rate of time. You know, we're in a universe where time runs at the same speed, but in animation, you can sort of change that around. Uh, and that's actually a fairly powerful thing. Rather than having to change the path, which can be very complicated, you can change the rate of flow of time. And, uh, you know, anyone, any real animators, you know, the kinds of do cartoons and stuff are very familiar with that. You know, they use easing tweeners, you know, where they sort of want, you know, when emotion stops, it doesn't just stop instantly. It usually kind of eases in and makes a transition and comes back. So you can do that kind of stuff using tweeners. Uh, since they have to do a little more uh, complicated work, these are objects. Uh, in a path, these are actually simple objects, which is good. Uh, and they define, as I said, it defines all the intermediate values between the beginning and ending values. And it only has a single method, which makes them fairly easy to implement. And it's just the at method. And you, it's always past the beginning and ending values, so it doesn't have to know. So they can be stateless. Uh, and it's also past the current time. Where is it during the animation? Now the times are uh, normalized times. So uh, all time always runs between 0 and 1 in terms of the animation. So even though it might last 15 seconds, uh, the time will be normalized. So it will be some time between 0 and 1. Uh, and then all it has to do is return what should the value be along the path at this particular time, given these beginning and ending values I was passed. Um, so any type of value can be animated as long as you ha are able to provide a path or you know of a path that exists that will work with that data type. So uh, these are the typical kinds of things you can do, instant floats and strings, uh, or tuples of those. Uh, tuples are very good for 2D and 3D type animations, and that's what we're using a lot in the presentation software. Uh, tweener is uh, related. It, it controls, like I said, the rate of flow of time. It has itself just a single method, uh, which is the same method at, but it's only given a single parameter. It's given where is it, and again, in this normalized time framework, what time are we at now? So it'll always be a number in the range from 0 to 1, and it has to, in turn, return a number in the range from 0 to 1. Um, again, if it, it's a 10-second animation, the animation system will take care of translating the normalized time into the actual time. And because it's a mapping from 0 to 1 into 0 to 1, it's, it's very easily composable with other tweeners, and we'll see an example of why that's a useful feature. So the main reason to use tweeners is to provide various special effects. One is, the, like I said, the ones that an animator normally uses, which are various types of easing, which provide more natural motions than rather just a rigid linear type animation. Uh, you can do things like bounces, 
Um, and another one I found uh, recently very interesting is a ramp tweener. And using that, uh, you can create overlapping staggered animation. So you might want to have 10 different things animating at the same time. You don't, they can't run sequentially because they're going to be overlapped in time, but you don't want them all to start at the same time. So you can't make them all concurrent and you can't make them sequential because they're overlapped. And you can use a tweener to do that. A tweener basically is just a simple ramp function. And so by specifying an offset into before the animation actually starts, you can sort of delay when the actual animation starts. Um, So um, the first demo I'm going to run here is uh, one that actually comes with facets called the Animation Lab. And it's sort of just there so that people can sort of learn and understand uh, how these animations work. So what we've got are two boxes. And right now, uh, it's got a bunch of views here, so I'm going to create the tweener graph. And we can see that we're running, let me bring up the uh, Okay, so what we've got is the ability to choose a, between a bunch of different paths and a bunch of different tweeners. Now we can choose three because, like I said, tweeners are composable. So we can do a simple composition just by stacking them up here. So right now we're running a linear path with linear tweeners. So you can see that the graphs are all lines. Now we can change, the, uh, uh, change it to a Manhattan path. So you can see the path certain goes in one direction, then goes in the other direction. So it's still going between the same begin and end values, but the path has changed. Uh, the time is still linear, though. But now if we switch to, a, say, an ease in, OK. So now you can see that the path is still the same now, but the actual rate of flow of time is different. That When it gets to the destination, it slows down and sort of eases into where it's going. And again, they're composable. So we could compose that, for example, with a ramp tweener. OK, so now I've composed these two uh, tweeners over here. And you can see the composite tweener over here. So it has a delay now before the animation starts. Then it starts off quickly and then slows into the final animation. OK, and you know, we can go on and on playing around with this, but I have the feeling we're going to run long. Um, one thing though, I thought might be fun would be to, let's turn off the, uh, go back to linear. And we're going to switch the tweener to custom. Okay, so I'm going to drag down another window here. So we've got a little custom tweener down here. So you can see it's got the method at, and right now it's just returning t. So it's a linear tweener. And we can turn it very easily into a quadratic tweener. And I'll just tell it to update that. Okay. So you can see a quadratic tweener is kind of like an ease out function. So it starts out fairly slowly and then um, you know, speeds up. And we'll do add one more term. Now we've got a cubic. And you know, it's, it's a cubic function. It's just basically just going to flatten out that curve a little more. So again, the effect is that it now starts out even, even more slowly and then speeds up as it goes along. So that's basically it. This is, like I said, it's a demo. It comes with facets. So you're free to play with it if you happen to get interested in this stuff. Um, now, one of the uh, Uh, more recent control they've added is a drawable canvas control, which is a simple graphical control. And all it does is render a sequence of drawable objects. Um, so drawable objects are things like, uh, you know, the usual suspects, rectangles, circles, polygons, theme text. And that's how this presentation tool is. It just uses this objects and creates a presentation tool by just using animation to move them around at the right times. Um, so it's specifically designed to make all the attributes of a drawable objects so that they're easily animatable. So it has attributes like origin, size, opacity, and so on. And as I mentioned, the, the presentation editor, which is what we're using, uses a draw canvas control in its implementation. Um, now the thing is, the draw canvas control itself, which is the thing I'm using here, is very simple. This is the entire class here. Okay, again, I took out all comments in, in white space so it would fit onto a slide, but this is the entire definition. Uh, so you can see it has a single facet, which is an instance of a drawable canvas. Uh, this is the paint method here, which is paints the content. Checks to make sure it has a, a canvas, and if it does, it just iterates over the items and draws them. 
in the current context. And then it has a couple other methods. One is to handle what happens if someone changes the size of the canvas while it's running. So it just has a thing to uh, update the uh, canvas size, which we use to update the bounds so that we can uh, adjust the size of anything which are size dependent. And then the only other thing is uh, a notification handler. So this is one of the declarative things where I'm just saying any time that the canvas modified um, attribute is changed, then we want to run this method which simply refreshes the display. So that's what handles you know, all the updates that occur when I do anything on this display. Um, so for example, when I say go on to the next slide, what I'm doing is I'm replacing the contents of the canvas with a new set of objects. Okay, well that changes the attribute which causes the canvas modified to be set, which causes it to refresh and so we need to see the next slide. Uh, so again, this is one of the reasons that I think Facets is a fairly powerful framework because you can write a little bit of code and get some fairly complex behavior without having to do a lot of work. Um, in particular, if you look at this code, there's no explicit animation support. I don't need to provide that because every object in Facets is animatable. So depending upon how you're going to use this control, you can provide whatever animation behavior you want. Um, so uh, time for another demo. Okay, so uh, again, in, in getting ready for this talk, is I wanted to put together a few demonstrations. So all of these are based on the drawable Canvas demo. So here we've taken some fairly, you know, typical applications, a little line plot, but we've animated. So it kind of, you know, fills up using the data that's available, and then after a while, this is a demo. It's not a tool. Uh, it goes away. Now we can add more animations here. So, you know, drag some here. So these are all things that. Uh, are all just simple animations by adding drawable objects to a canvas and then animating various parameters on the object. And you know we can switch, uh, get a little scatter plot. So instead of just displaying the data, you can animate it on, animate it off. Um, so you know all of these are fairly short little demonstrations, uh, written mostly well a few lines of code. And again, th this is all part of the Facets demo. So this same demo is uh, available as uh, part of the Facets package. Um, all right, enough of that. So those are kind of fanciful uses, you know, you can imagine your own uses, but um, animation can also be an integral part of any controls design. Um, and in particular, there's a bunch of uh, editors and controls that I've written that already are using animation as part of the design of the control itself. Um, and uh, hopefully the, the toolbar control is interesting. Hopefully I'll have time to uh, Maybe not <laughs> to get into that. So uh, take a quick look. All right. So one of the tools uh, editors that comes with fast is image zoom editor. So it's a fairly typical workhorse editor. Anytime you're dealing with images, you can use it for viewing images. Supports zoom shrink. Provides detailed pixel level information, uh, and it's used in a number of tools and demos that are part of the package. And it uses animation when zooming and shrinking images. So you can double click an image to animate uh, the zoom. So um, bring up an example of that. So here we're just displaying a, an image. Let me uh, change it to show it shows hue information. So I can manually zoom in and out of this thing or I can use the uh, by double clicking I can sort of animate the, uh, the thing. Animate in. Now I can select things. So again you can see uh, you can get some fairly detailed information. This is, I originally wrote it because I, uh, a lot of tools I do, I'm actually interested in the kinds of interaction of colors at different levels. So being able to get in there and see the hues and so on is stuff I want to be able to do. And uh, so this tool supports that. Uh, anyway, so that's a, just a quick example of how you can integrate uh, animation easily. And it's just a single facet being, a, uh, you know, it's just the, uh, the zoom level facet of the, uh, the image object that's being animated. Uh, light table editor is another uh, editor that uses animation. It's sort of incidental. Uh, so it's an editor that's useful for scanning, browsing, selecting images. And just for fun, I threw in animation. All right, so here we have, uh, this is, uh, again, a tool. It's like a 
it's a light table, so you can bring up a bunch of images and use it. You know, you can make images bigger and smaller and all that kind of stuff. But I want to show the animation. I'm just gonna. So this is uh, just simply animating the origin, you know, of each of the uh, the uh, items, and they're all following different paths and so on. So uh, fairly simple to do. And uh, you can see we're not going to make it. And uh, the final demonstration was uh, a tool built using the, uh, the tool framework and has a simple image pipeline. Uh, input image is selected via the file stack, same tool we're using here on the left. Uh, an image flows into an image transformer, which we'll see, and then to an image knife, and then finally to an image tiler object. Um, and then the animation station, the control grabber, uh, which are tools you know, added using the uh, tool framework, uh, are sort of the secret sauce. So the control grabber is, is a tool that allows you to grab any tool or any uh, view element in your UI and extract out its object, underlying object information. So you can then introspect it and do some other interesting things, which we'll see. And then the animation station uses that information. It's hooked up to the control grabber. So it gets in and it sees the object that's been given. It introspects, finds the facets, sees what types there are, and says, oh, I can animate these, this one, this one, that one. Um, so it's mostly uh, uh, a demonstration that anything can be animated. Okay, So all the ones we so far have done, you know, the animations have been sort of cooked up ahead of time. Uh, but here we can write, sort of do them interactively while the demo is running. Okay, so first off, let's get an image to look at, and uh, I think I did a, these are some open source images I uh, found. And uh, so basically, we can look at the tool pipeline. So there's the image transformer tool, and I'm just going to go in there, and I'm just going to do a little hue transform in that. So I'm doing it manually by adjusting the sliders. And then it flows into the image knife tool, which it's a little easier to see if we zoom that out. So we might say, oh, we've got a little fat at the bottom here. We don't really need that. So I can just sort of interactively crop that off. And then since this tool is piping into the image tiler, you can see that those changes are affecting as we uh, do the cropping because the, uh, the image is now a different size. And crop a little off the top there. All right. Um, and then over in the image tiler itself, let me uh, get the animus, animus animation station ready to go, is we can play around with some of these. So I'm going to do a little X shift here. So we can shift the images. Uh, uh, actually, I'm going to reset that. What I really want to do is play around with the Y spacing. So I'm going to overlap the images a bit. Okay. Now I'm going to go off and I'm going to drag the control grabber, which I'm just a little icon over here, and I drop it on here. And that, since that tool is connected to the animation station, it says, oh, got a new tool. And uh, I'm going to go in, introspect that. And I've gone off and I've analyzed the facets that I have paths that I know how to do animation on. And I've extracted all those, and it's just making those available for me now. So um, we can take, for example, the X shift, and we, we can specify the starting and ending values. Now, for this particular one, a good one, I've uh, practiced this a little bit, is uh, 255 is a good value. And I'll just start the animation going. Okay, So you can say I'm just sort of dynamically creating an animation. Well, it's using its uh, reciprocating, which isn't particularly nice. I'm going to turn off the reciprocating. So now it appears to have a nice, except it's going the wrong way. All right, so let's change that around. It should go from 255 to 0. Okay, So now it animates the correct way, or at least visually makes some sense. And uh, now I want to change the Y. Um, spacing one here. So right now it's going between, it's around minus 120, so let me uh, make that from, let's say, 90 to maybe 130. And uh, turn that on. So this is a typical kind of game you used to get in some of the old school, uh, early PC games, kind of a parallax effect. And in fact, let's adjust the origin because it looks like the fish way at the top are frozen. So I'm just going to use the manual controls, the image tiler, and now you know, we've kind of got this thing going. Now, we can do this and other things. So I'm going to go back to the image transformer for a second. Now I'm going to drag that guy and drop it on this guy. And now we go back to the animation station. You can see he's got a new object that he's been told about. So now we've got another set of controls we can animate. So I'm going to move that down. Uh, the hue 
is a good one to do. It makes for a fun demo. And except we don't want Hugh shifting over uh, one second. That's a little too abrupt. So let's say make the animation around nine seconds. And now we'll just start that going. And uh, so now we've got all that going. So the point here was, to, again, demonstrate that anything in facets can be animated. I, you know, none of these were known ahead of time. You know, I just wrote this tool, and I drag and dropped, and I hooked them up on the fly, and away you go. So uh, anything you can think of, you can animate. And so sort of the, the sky, uh, sky's the limit. Now I'm going to turn the wall back off. We're really going to keep moving here. All right, so this is the same information as before. I don't think anything is different about this. Um, I'll put the, uh, I'll leave the one up on the last one if you want to write any of this stuff down. Uh, eventually, these slides will be on the website as well. I haven't got them posted yet, but um, any questions? Okay. All right. And now, finally, the last one which is uh, about another recent extension to the uh, um, package, which is the MongoDB OML package. So, um, you know, a lot of people here have done a lot of web stuff, so um, probably already familiar somewhat with MongoDB, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that. So one of the new generation NoSQL databases, schema lists based on documents, um, bindings available, including uh, the PyMongo, which is one of the more popular Python bindings. Uh, its primary data type, when you use it from Python, is JSON or uh, uh, Bison, I think is the dialect they use. Uh, and then what is facets? Well, again, it's the reactive framework. Again, the talks are sort of written independently, so they could be presented, but it's what I've been talking about. The uh, this I don't have any time to go over now, but the emphasis is on building interacting models. So it's, uh, that's sort of the way you go about building applications in, in, in facets is define your models and then they interact in some ways. And as we've pointed out, some powerful introspection and metadata interfaces, uh, rich set of UI, which, you know, you've seen some of that. And so what's the MongoDB OML? Well, that's a layer I've written that sort of sits between the two. It's an object mapping layer. It's not called an ORM because it's not, uh, uh, it's not a relational mapping. And it's an attempt to combine the best of both worlds, the MongoDB world and the facets world. And it does that by mapping facets models onto a Mongo database document model. And it does it using uh, facets introspection and the reactive capabilities. And so the result ends up being uh, a natural extension to the existing facets programming model. It supports a nice simple query interface and it maps directly onto the Mongo database. And uh, so I'm going to hopefully have time to present a quick example. Uh, the example, which I don't think we're going to have time to go into too much detail, is a simple document indexing system that indexes words and frequency of occurrence in a document collection, uh, works with text and Python files, and it's divided into two tools, one a command line indexer and the other is a facets-based uh, query and browse tool. And since uh, facets is model oriented, we're going to start with the uh, data model, which has two classes, the index document class, which is, uh, represents a, an indexed document, and index word, which is a word within an indexed document. All right, so here are the two uh, document classes um, that we're going to have. One is index document, and the other is indexed word. Now, uh, they're strictly declarative, so that one, in, you know, we just have a couple of attributes each. And we import a bunch of things from the MongoDB, the Facets MongoDB package. And the next slide, I explain a little more about that one. It, any model class that you want to use with the Mongo database, you derive from MongoDB object. Uh, by deriving from has facets, you get all of the capabilities that facets has. And then the MongoDB object uh, adds the, uh, the object mapping layer hooks on top of that. And all the requirement is that you define your model facets using uh, various DB type attributes. And one thing uh, we didn't probably, uh, I'm not going to have time to spend, is that I did define an index for the database doing that. Uh, so any DB type facet is the thing that's going to be stored in a database. And uh, you can also use normal facets. So if you have object values that don't need to be persisted in a database, you can just uh, add those into the model as well. They won't be persisted. 
So this is the only code in the entire application suite that has any explicit reference to MongoDB uh, OML. And everything else is just standard uh, facets kind of stuff. And I uh, don't think we're going to have much time. So um, luckily, uh, you know, the, the full code for the application is in the, the facets package. And uh, I think I'm just going to... Uh, Try to this is the main loop of the application where we're indexing we have an iterator which is going to cough up each of the words in the document and then uh, basically we're iterating over each of the word and adding a new database object uh, since that's fairly simple stuff I think keep things going uh, Um, yeah, I don't think we're going to really have enough time to get into this presentation just because uh, we're running out of time. Um, so let me, let me bring up the last screen again in case anyone wants to uh, jot any of that information down. Uh, the only interesting link really at this point would be the uh, user's guide because that, that has all the links to all the other places. So if you remember that one, it'll link you in the other... Uh, the links, they're all on the right-hand side of, of any page on the website. Um, so that's about it. Um, any questions? All right. Thank you. Yeah, if you, uh, if you actually download the code, there's uh, lots of examples. There's a whole UI demo that has over 100 different demos. So you can, in the animation, there's like 20 or 30 different animation demos. So. And uh, most of them are using PyQT or just something that's uh, Right now, everything is built on PyQT. So that, there's, you won't see any QT code in there because it all uses much higher level abstractions. But the underlying thing works with QT. Uh, it can work with WX Python. Uh, when I did a version about five or six years ago, it actually ran on WX Python. The first version I did W, you know, ten years ago ran on Tickle. Uh, you know, but over time, you know, we keep sort of evolving the toolkits, and, and the ones we don't use much kind of fall in disuse, so they aren't kept up to date as much. And it's just me working on it for the most part, and uh, so uh, it's hard to keep them all up to the same level. But they could be brought up to speed, you know, if there was any community interest in trying to get any particular package working so